I'm Mary Tipton Woolley. I have two first names and one last name. I am the Senior Associate Director here at Georgia Tech. I've been at Georgia Tech for over 11 years and have worked in college admission for over 20 at a couple of different institutions. I merely introduced myself that way in the hopes that you'll buy some of what I'm saying. Um, I work with students from all over the world throughout my career and I'm excited to get to share a little bit with you today about what is frankly a year unlike any other in my admission career, but we're doing it together. So hopefully we can answer some questions about that today. Now that a lot of folks are starting to log into Common App, uh, they might notice that the personal essay is not required for Georgia Tech. So can you walk us through the updates and how Georgia Tech will be reviewing students' pieces of writing this year? Absolutely. Sammy jumped right into a really great question. We have made the decision this year to not review the, the long essay or the common app personal essay. People call it different things. I always tell students it's the essay where you have seven prompts and you can write 650 words. So. Um, we are not going to be reviewing that essay this year. And the reason why is for the last few years, we have come to realize that the supplemental essay questions that are in the Georgia Tech part of the application are really much more important to the decisions that we're making. And in a year where you have some extra opportunities for writing um, with the COVID essay and the standard additional information, we also now have two supplemental essay questions. We just realized that at some point we wanted to um, give students a break from the writing, frankly, and really allow you to focus on the essays that are going to be most important to us as we make admission decisions. I should say, for kind of a little more general beyond Georgia Tech, there are many schools that feel very strongly about the importance of the personal essay, so you shouldn't ignore that for all schools that you may be applying to, but at least for Georgia Tech, especially if we happen to be the first application you're submitting, that's one thing that you can take off your worry list. Great. Okay, let's start with the most high level question and, and that is what is Georgia Tech's uh, test score policy for 2021? For 2021, we are currently test score optional. Uh, the funny part about test score optional is that really means that it's completely your choice. It is optional to us, it's the choice of the student. In a normal year, I would be saying, take a look at the test scores you have, decide whether or not they are going to be a great addition to your application, and then make the choice about whether or not to submit them to us. We recognize this year, many of you may be, frankly, not even sitting on scores. You haven't had the opportunity to test, given all the issues that have happened with COVID and testing. So in this year, it is ultimately your choice whether or not you would like to submit, and you'll indicate that to us on your application if you would like us to consider test scores as we review your admission application. Okay, cool. How will applications be reviewed without test scores or with test scores? Uh, we specifically had a student ask, you know, will sending my good test score help? So, so how do we approach test scores when we do review them? Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. You know, the good news is we have been reviewing applications holistically at Georgia Tech for over a decade. And by holistically, I mean evaluating a wide variety of factors when we make admission decisions for students and testing has been one incredibly small part of that. Um, over the last several years, test scores have had decreasing significance in the decisions we're making. And so we feel really well equipped to make decisions thinking about students' academic preparations with the courses you've taken in high school, thinking about the contribution you're making in your school and community. Um, these are the kinds of things that we're going to be considering and have, have always had more weight than test scores ever did. So we real, like again, we feel really confident in our ability. If you're just staring at your test score, not sure if it meets this sort of mythical mark to submit it to Georgia Tech, um, I wanna try to take that worry away from you today because I can pretty much guarantee you in my experience, that test score that you may think is not quite there would almost never be the reason that we would admit a student or not admit a student. And that's the reality. It's, much more important for us to understand your day in, day out record in high school academically. Okay. What if a student, you know, has already sent test scores uh, or tells us they don't want to send test scores, right? And then changes their mind. What, what does that look like? Absolutely. Well, we want the choice to be yours. So that means we need to give you the choice beyond just the point that you submit your application. So students who apply to Georgia Tech, will have the opportunity to change their mind about whether or not they want us to review test scores. But I honestly have to return back to the last question. We were talking about the importance, or in this case, the lack thereof. 
I would hate to think that students are just continuing that consternation and worry about testing in a year where we know testing is a challenge, whether that's to actually even get a testing seat or if it's a fear over going to test in the midst of a pandemic. If we can take a worry away that you just don't have to worry about testing this year, we want to do that. And again, we want to ultimately let the choice be yours, but we also, I just cannot emphasize enough how important it is for you to remember that this is a very small part of the admission decision and we feel incredibly equipped to do our decisions without your test scores. So we'll come back to test scores in a minute here. We got a question on Facebook from Dean asking, how will students accepted for 2020 who opted to take a gap year impact applicants for fall 2021? That's a big question. We've been getting a lot of that. So I'll give you the facts. We had just around 135 students defer from 2020 for our first year class. Um, but what you may not realize is that students could defer to spring, summer, and fall. And it's actually fairly evenly distributed between spring, a little sprinkle in summer, and then the rest in fall. So that's one thing that should be a tip to you to know that the impact is not maybe as great as you had expected it to be. And then the last thing I can tell you is just simply we are not going to be decreasing our 2021 incoming class size to allow, th those will just be additional students in our um, first year class in 2021 because Frankly, some of those students may ultimately decide that Georgia Tech's not the right place for them for a wide variety of reasons, some of which may be directly related to COVID and the pandemic and things that are happening in their, in their personal life. And so we do not expect any changes in our class size for 2021. I bet somebody's going to ask you, Sammy, what's our expected class size for 2021? <laughs> so we enrolled just around 3275 first year students this year. And I would expect that our class size next year would be that or maybe slightly above that, especially with some deferred students added in. Um, so let me just put that out there as well. No firm number yet though. Sure. So I think this is actually a pretty good question to cover early on because it's kind of like high level, big picture, like what does the application process look like after the student submits? Like, what, what are we looking at when we're reviewing applications? Yeah, that's a, like the mystery of the application <laughs> going into cyberspace. It's funny because you've controlled everything, right? To the point that you hit submit, it's been in your control. What have you done in high school? How have you filled out your application? And all of a sudden your application just disappears. Um, I reviewed files back in the day when they were in paper. So it was literally this mailing of the application. I don't know if that was better or not, but in terms of what happens in our office, we have a multi-staged review process that ensures every student who applies is going to be looked at by at minimum two people in our office before we make an admission decision. Though to be honest with you, most applications are open three to four times before we make a final decision. And as you can probably imagine, you know, we start out with this big group of students and our goal in each of our rounds of admission is to continuing, to continue, excuse me, to continue to narrow that group of students that we would like to offer admission to. And we do that through individual reviews and then also through a committee process a little bit later in the game. I saw a question kind of earlier pop into the Instagram and it was asking, I'm gonna expand it a little bit. It was asking specifically about the October SAT score, which will be released on October 16th, but the deadline for early action is October 15th. Mm -hmm. So, what does timeline look like in terms of like sending documents if a student does choose to send test scores? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a document deadline that's beyond our applicant deadline. So actually you could expand this question beyond just testing. If yeah. you're thinking about your high school counselor that's submitting transcripts or recommendations, I know a lot of times students put pressure on high school counselors to have those things here before you even submit your application when in reality, they have a few extra weeks. Um, and so the same would be said of test scores. Those October test scores would be fine in an early action round. Oh yeah. So what specific experience, uh, experiences are Georgia Tech admission counselors looking for in applicants? What special characteristics do applicants have? So what are you looking for when you're, when you're, looking, when you're doing an application review? Yeah, if only there was a specific formula you could follow, admission would be so much easier, right? <laughs> um, you know, in the first piece about specific experiences, a lot of times that question is phrased to us as something like, how many community service hours do I have to do? Or do I have to play a sport? And I always say, nope, 
But you know, we're in admissions, so we talk more than answers like that. So to expand on that, what that really means is if if there was a formula, if there were specific experiences that we wanted students to have for every single student we admit, we'd be kind of a boring place. We want students that have different interests and talents that come to our campus. And so what we're really considering is where have you really spent your time? Where have you had an impact? Um, where are you making a contribution? And I always tell students that we talk about what is your contribution to your community and that you should define community broadly. That could be your school community. It could be your literal community. Uh, this year more than ever, it may be right in your home, in your family. If you've had family responsibilities, it may have been a dialed up a notch in the midst of COVID. I, I know a lot of students have had that. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking for, which is different than specific experiences. Yeah. You ask a sort of a second part to that was a little bit more about what are we looking for in a student. So it's kind of a similar question, but maybe a little bit different. I, um, you know, we're looking for students who have shown throughout high school that they are academically focused. They're going to show us that because they've been willing to, um, you know, in the course selection that they make, they've been willing to take rigorous courses and put in the time that it's going to take to do well in those classes. I, I would put that in the sort of academically curious, risk-taking category, perhaps. And there are students who have shown us that they have a connection and they, they understand what Georgia Tech can offer to them and how they're going to be able to contribute to our campus. We see a lot of that through the, why do you want to come to Georgia Tech question, which that's not literally how it's phrased, but this idea of have you really, do you really understand what Georgia Tech is about and how your role here, um, how Georgia Tech can sort of put you on your path for after graduation. Wonderful. So you mentioned briefly, I'm going to pick out a nugget that you mentioned in there in terms of impact um, with COVID. Lucy had a question about should we answer the COVID question if we have not been seriously impacted? That's a really good question. I've gotten that from a lot of students. I mean, I think we're going to make some assumptions this year and assumptions get us in trouble a lot. So I totally recognize that. But we are assuming that most students had their spring of junior year impacted probably by a disruption in school where they may have moved, moved to virtual, et cetera. And there's all kinds of iterations of that. We're also making assumptions that the impact may have extended to activities you've been a part of that were suspended or you're not able to go to sport competitions or the robotics meet or whatever the case may be. If that's what you're telling us about, we're sort of reading at that baseline. But there are a lot of students who the impacts have been much greater. They may have been, um, you know, they had to actually stop doing things that they could have still done because all of a sudden they had to help their younger sibling in their virtual schooling at home. That's just one example. Not all of you will fall into that category. Um, it could be a student whose family has been impacted either health-wise or um, their socioeconomic situation could have been impacted by COVID. There's so many examples of ways students have been impacted that are not the norm. That's when I think the COVID question is really appropriate. Um, can I add to that about COVID versus additional information? Oh, for sure. Okay, thanks, Amy. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of a question too about what should go where. There's two questions, COVID, additional information. I think additional information should be more in the category of things that have been around for a while. These are, you know, you've had an impact in high school because of, I don't know, maybe a, there's all kinds of things. We see examples of students that have had disabilities they've had to work through in high school or maybe a family situation, uh, could be a death in the family or divorced parents, whatever the case may be, that they feel we need to understand why that's impacted their school experience. And that's actually not related to COVID. <laughs> and so that's really more on the additional information side. So I'll just put that out there. The baseline on all this is if you feel that you need to tell us something in the application and you haven't found a space to do that in the activity section and the Georgia Tech supplemental essay questions, then the COVID question or additional information are the place to do that. Okay. Is there a difference in the two early action deadlines? Um, let's start with that part. Is there a difference in the two early action deadlines? And okay. actually, and regular decision. We'll put that in there too. Sure. So yes, but no is my answer. Isn't that a great admission person question? So um, early action at Georgia Tech is non-binding. It's for students who want to apply early. They'd like to receive their admission decision early. Um, a student might consider regular decision if they feel that we really need to see their fall grades in their senior year. I did admit earlier today in a school visit that maybe my advice on that has shifted a little bit this year because everybody had an impact in junior year. Um, 
But we have two early action deadlines. So let's get to the sort of nuts and bolts of this. Early action one has a deadline of October the 15th. And that is for students in Georgia, students that attend Georgia high schools or any Georgia resident that's currently living out of the state. The reason for that is in the last many years, about 75 to 80 percent of students who apply from Georgia apply in an early action round. We also know that about 60 percent of our undergrad population is from the state of Georgia. We also know that students in Georgia start school really early. Um, in a normal year, our students would be back in school in late July, early August, and in many parts of the country and the world, school starts are much, much later than that. And so, in thinking about that, October 15th, having that deadline a little bit earlier for Georgia students gives us a chance to prioritize review of those applications first. We'll be releasing those decisions in mid-December, which is about a month earlier than we've been able to do in the last several years. And then we can move on to our non-Georgia and international students who apply in our early action two deadline. And that deadline is November the 2nd this year. And so that's giving a little bit more time for those students that start school a little bit later. And we're committed to reviewing and releasing those admission decisions in mid-January. Then we're gonna roll up into regular decision deadline of January the 4th, and we'll release those decisions in mid-March. You know, common questions around this is, it's often phrased, is it easier to get in early versus regular? And the answer to that is that it's not so simple as looking at statistics. So let this be your lesson today that stats often do not tell the entire story, um, especially in college admission, but probably in life. So I just told you that 75 to 80 percent of students who apply from Georgia apply in early action. What I didn't tell you is that we admit as a public university in the state of Georgia, we admit Georgia students at more than double the rate that of non-Georgia students. So I bet everybody watching is smart enough to now realize that we're gonna admit a lot more students in our early action round because of those numbers I just told you. But the application process and the review process is exactly the same for students who apply in our early action rounds or in a regular decision round. Okay, it's the same. So, so that answers, yep, this question here. Difference in acceptance considerations between early and regular, it's the same. I saw one more question sort of in the same realm about if I am deferred, does that mean I go to regular decision? That's a really great question. So if you apply early, you could receive one of three admission decisions, admit and deny, those are pretty clear. Defer is for students who were not, were just not quite ready to make an admission decision yet. By deferring your application, you don't reapply. We are going to relook at your application in our regular decision round with all the other students who applied in that round. And we're gonna ask you to send us your fall term, first semester um, grades from your senior year, which is something that we want you to add to your application. Yeah, and Anna asked earlier, what are the benefits for applying early action versus regular decision? When I think about that, I think about scholarships. What do you, what, what do you think in, in that regard? Yeah, I do think that um, to be considered for any of our merit scholarships or special programs like Grand Challenges, Living Learning Communities, <clears throat> the Honors Program, you have to apply by the deadline that is related to early action. Um, I, some other things I would think about is if Georgia Tech has been at the top of your list for a while and you're anxious to get an admission decision, you're going to find out sooner if you apply early action, um, unless you're deferred, obviously we just talked about that but you always still have until May the 1st to make an admission decision. So that's another piece that I would just mention. I actually often think of it in the reverse. When is it an in in advantage to me to apply in regular decision? And I sort of touched on this just a minute ago, but I think if you're a student who maybe you've had an upper grade trend or maybe junior year didn't go quite like you wanted it to, or maybe in your senior year, you're really ramped up the you know, number of AP courses, for instance, you're not all in AP programs, but the rigor of the courses in your senior year and you'd like to show us how you're performing in those classes, then regular decision might be a better option for you. So those are just some things to think about, maybe the little bit of the reverse of that question. Okay, let's hang on to what you're saying about rigor right now, because we're gonna come back to that. But I have a super, I think this one will be super quick. Can, um, there was a question about how students can send test scores. Is it official? Is it self-reported? What does that look like? Yes to all of the above, um, but self-reported is a really great option and there are more and more universities that allow you to do that, so you should definitely look out for that. The whole idea behind self-reported is when you complete your common application, you can self-report any tests that you would like us to know about in those scores, um, or once you've applied, you have access to a form and your admission portal that you can continue to update scores for us. 
the advantage of that is you don't need to use up a score send or pay extra money to send Georgia Tech your scores when you don't even know if you've been admitted. But ultimately, um, it, official scores are fine as well. So official scores are fine, always good to do it that way. That means they come directly from the testing service, but self-reported is also okay. Um, and just a reminder this year, not sending scores at all is also okay. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so I said we'd come back to rigor. This is it. Do you factor in the difficulty of the high school classes? So I, I think the way I heard that question, hopefully I'll answer this, is we're gonna look, I like this question because it is a good reminder for me to talk about the fact that every student is reviewed in the context of the high school that they attend. We're not asking you to take classes that are at a high school down the road. We're looking at what is available to you and how you're taking advantage of that. I have to expand that just a little bit because many of you will have the opportunity to take dual enrollment courses, so it may not literally be in the walls of your high school, but they're really considered part of your high school curriculum. And so yeah, that rigor is all based on what's available to you and how you're taking advantage of that. Okay, and then a question about um, what GPAs do we consider? That's a good question. So we consider the GPA off your high school transcript. We do not recalculate a GPA in the admission process. Um, if, so if you wanna know what GPA we're gonna use in our process, take a look at your transcript. Some of you go to schools that are on some version of a 4.0 scale. I say some version, because sometimes that's really a 4.5 or a five or a six with weight added in. Um, we're gonna take that GPA straight off the transcript. We'll always take weighted if it's available, unweighted if not. And then some of you go to schools that we're gonna see a 100 point grading scale. So your grades might go to 100 or 110 or 120 in some places. I, I will just say that the GPA, you should never view that as the only thing we're considering. I think of the GPA as a gateway into your transcript because what's more important to me are the courses that you're taking and how those develop over time, right? It's not like you walk in as a freshman in high school and take 10 AP classes. I don't know a student who's ever done that, but you build over time, you build on that rigor. And then it's also about how your, how you, your grade trends are um, showing to us. You know, what are your trends in each individual subject and then across the four years or the three years that you've been in high school? Sure, perfect, okay. So I'm seeing here, um, how is intended major factored into admission? Yeah, that's a really good and a very common question that we get about major. It is certainly something that we're gonna consider when you apply, but you're applying at Georgia Tech, you're applying to be part of our first year class. You will tell us on your application what you're interested in studying. You can tell us that you're interested in studying you know, X, but you're also thinking about Y. You can basically give us two choices. When, we, when you think about holistic admission review, holistic by definition is taking in as much information as we can to make a decision. And, and one of the things when you're applying to a place that has selective or competitive admission like Georgia Tech, you know, we, we have more students who are qualified to be students at Georgia Tech than we have space in our first year class. So you'll hear a lot of universities talk about this and they'll say they're crafting a class or putting together a class or shaping a class or how, however they phrase it. What they're really trying to tell you is we want students on our campus to have interesting conversations in their residence halls, in their labs, in their classrooms, and that starts with bringing in a diverse group in our first year class. And a big piece of that diversity is from an academic standpoint. We could easily enroll every single first year student in the same major. That would be bad for all kinds of reasons. <laughs> it would be you know, boring for you. We know that the best problem solvers are teams of students that come together and approach problems from a different set of expertise. Um, so it's certainly something that we're thinking about as we make admission decisions, but they're made here in the undergraduate admission office as part of our first year class. There's not a quota by major or by college, and you don't apply explicitly to this college or that college. So a little bit different than some schools, but hopefully that helps you understand here. Considering SAT, ACT is optional this year, will subject SAT scores be considered at all? You did not ask me that. Okay. <laughs> and we have never considered a subject test as a requirement at okay. Georgia Tech. And I would actually go a step further to say they've never really been very helpful. It will probably not surprise a single person watching this today to know that students tend to test in areas that are their strengths. You're self-selecting in the subject test. And so the scores we receive usually are just reaffirming what we already knew based on courses you've taken in high school and your grades there. Okay. I'm gonna 
combine this question that I'm seeing from, I believe the student's name is Amy, um, with one that I've been getting a lot. So she wants to know in terms of merit scholarships, how you qualify for those. And to add on to that, will a student be considered for scholarships if they don't apply with test scores? Yep, absolutely. So um, merit scholarship to be considered, all you have to do is apply by October 15th if you're in Georgia or November the 2nd if you're outside of Georgia to be considered for merit scholarships. And students will be considered for merit scholarships without test scores just like we'll be doing on the first year admission side. So there's really no difference there. Okay, perfect. So next question was about um, moving. So if a student moved through high school, how do we adjust for that in our application review process? Yeah, I mean, we read a lot of students every year who've had some type of school change while they're in high school, and certainly it's not uncommon to see impacts to course progression or you know involvement in school. I think the first thing I would say is if you feel that you have a bit of a story to tell there that we're not gonna be able to um, interpret from just looking at a transcript or looking at your activities or whatnot, that would be a great example of something you might want to use additional information to share with us. Um, but in general, we totally understand that a move can have those kinds of impacts that I just described. I, I can't give you like an exactly how that factors in because in holistic in general, this is, this is a bit of a discussion and it's a qualitative kind of conversation surrounding an application. But it's certainly something we always note especially because sometimes that student looks a little bit different than the high school they're sitting in now. Sometimes their GPA just looks totally different because we had to recalculate one. You know, Sammy was talking about GPAs earlier. We, we try not to recalculate, but sometimes we have to. And in school changes, that's not uncommon for us to need to do that. And so we need to understand why the student looks a little bit different in their current high school. And so we always flag if a student has moved throughout high school and make sure we can understand what impacts that has, that's had. Perfect. So AP testing looked a, a little bit dear and uh, different this year under the circumstances they were taken. So will the influence of AP scores on application decision change based on that? But to be honest, AP scores have not had much of an impact on admission decisions. So in that sense, there will be no change. We are well aware of the at-home testing and um, sort of some of the impacts that happened in the spring. Just to expand that a little bit, if you were in an IB curriculum or maybe taking um, A-level exams, we're also attuned to impacts there. Probably y'all aren't there yet because you're just now seniors, but there may be a few of you out there applying after you've completed those this past summer. Like I said, the students who sit for AP exams, what those scores tend to do is confirm their performance in the class. That's what we see most notably. Um, and they, like I said, they really just don't have an impact on our admission decision. So I guess my simple answer, I could have just said, it's no different from the past because they've never really had a big role in our admission decision. Right, so so not required. Um, Courtney, right. that, that answers your question. Do you consider scores on AP exams? If you, if you send them, um, we will. If you don't send them, that is, that is perfectly fine. Uh, another question is how will we adjust for missed volunteer opportunities and community service and I'll even expand that just to sort of just general opportunities that that would have looked different over the past few months. Absolutely. I just um, did a visit earlier today with a student who didn't get to do something she thought she was going to be doing this summer. So it's a really common conversation that we are having. But the question I have been posing to students is what have you gotten to do during COVID that you wouldn't have done otherwise? So in my own personal life, it's been riding a bike because we finally got our daughter to ride a bike and I got a bike and we got a puppy. So those are my two things. Is that weird to put that on a college application? I mean, truthfully, in a normal year, I would say yes. This year, I don't know, maybe not. I mean, I, there's so <laughs> many students that have done int really interesting things that I don't think you would have had the opportunity to do in a normal year. We had two neighbors who started a bread baking business, which is really bad on you know the hips, but really tasty. So these are if you've done some of these kinds of things, I've had students tell me they took up embroidery or that they got to take some classes online. Um, please tell us about those things. It may be that you missed chances that you thought you were going to have, but it actually opened doors to do things that you weren't expecting. And so I think if you can put that positive spin on it, because we, you know, we sort of assume that most students who apply have been impacted in some way 
in many cases, it's going to be in activities that they thought would be that have not been. And so that is um, sort of a baseline assumption as we review applications this year, but helping us to get an understanding for opportunities that you've had or responsibilities that you've had because of this that are different than you're expecting, that's what's really going to help um, in the application review. Perfect. And, and Cindy on Facebook had a question that I can answer real quick that just says, you know, so you're saying if a student's GPA on um, their transcript is only based on a 4.0 scale, that won't hurt the student when they're compared to other students' GPA that are based on high, higher scales. And that's exactly correct because each high school is so different that we're going to review students within the context of, of really just their high school and, and what students at that high school, that scale looks like. Okay. Does demonstrated interest have an impact on the application process? It does not, it never has, and we do not use demonstrated interest in our process. So don't make a list and call us every day. You don't need to do that. Take that worry away. We hope that you have done your research and understand Georgia Tech. That's gonna help you to be a better applicant, to better express your fit to Georgia Tech in your application, but we're not literally like ticking off a mark because you visited or um, logged in today or whatever the case may be. Same question, but about legacy. So does how do we consider legacy in the application review process? Yeah, we absolutely recognize those family connections to Georgia Tech can at times be really strong, um, but a student is applying as their own self. So, uh, you know, we recognize and want to keep family connections where we can, but a student has to be their own applicant and be admitted on, on their own two feet, if you will. Sure. So a few questions here. Contribution to community, what is that? That's, that's not on the Common App, so what is contribution to community? What are we looking for there? It's like this fancy name for extracurricular activities. <laughs> I mean, truly, we, we changed, we used to say extracurricular activities, and then we said leadership, but leadership connotates being an officer, which is not the only way you express leadership. So contribution to community is intended to cast a wide net in the way that students are involved outside of their academic experience in high school. And we hope that that helps students to remember that beyond just clubs you're a part of in school or sports that you play in school or your community, that this also would encompass things like religious activities in your local church or synagogue, or it might encompass work experience. You know, in this year's first year class, over 40% of our students had a paying job in high school. That's just one example. Um, it would encompass things like research or internships. It should encompass things you're doing, sort of like your own personal maker tinkering space that you may be doing. It might include family responsibilities. If you have responsibilities with a sibling or maybe elder care in your home, the whole purpose of saying contribution to community is to help you to think pretty broadly about what you're listing in that activity section. And actually the Common App allows you to do that but I think when you look at it at first, it doesn't seem evident that it, we want you to list that you've needed to, you know, babysit your younger sibling for 10 hours a week after school. That's going to have an impact on what you can do in school. We want to understand those kinds of things. Can you talk a little bit about um, visits? Is campus open? How can a student sort of engage with campus and, and learn about Georgia Tech? Yeah, this is really tough this year. I think that opportunity to go and touch and feel and smell a college campus is, is missing a little bit right now, whether that's from just inability to travel or college campuses that are closed. We do have students on campus this fall. Um, it certainly looks different than a normal fall, but we do have students here. We are not currently hosting visits in our office, but families could come to campus and take a self-guided tour, so that's one option. What I would actually spend more time telling you about are all the options we offer virtually, and I totally get that the virtual meeting fatigue is a real thing. I, this is my, I think, fifth virtual, maybe sixth virtual meeting-ish experience today. So <laughs> it's a real thing and we totally understand that, but there's a lot of great opportunities to engage beyond admission. You may have an interest in a particular major or college and all of our colleges and many of our majors are doing specific virtual information sessions, maybe tours of their spaces. There's also some um, sort of non-departmental groups that are doing things like our living learning communities are doing the virtual sessions. Our makerspace, the invention studio is doing a virtual tour. So those are great opportunities to see part of campus. And then the last thing I would mention that just started this week, our tour guides are hosting virtual tours of campus. So um, you can get a tour around campus with a student 
And I think that ability to talk to students and understand their perspective is a big part of what is missed in not coming to campus for a regular visit. So hopefully this will feel, fill a little bit of that void. Okay. Um, will a student who doesn't submit test scores be less competitive than a student who does submit test scores? I just want to say no and stop there, like no is a big period. I have to tell you that the worst part of test score optional is how much time we're talking about testing <laughs> because it's, it's frankly making testing outside to the admission process. And so absolutely not. If you apply without test scores, you're going to be considered in the exact same manner that we would consider a student with test scores. Okay. Uh, do, can you please talk about the activity list? Are you looking for activities that are more career focused, that students have been doing for all four years? How do we review activities? I think the best advice I have about the activity section, first off, is there is not a formula for activities. Everybody is going to be doing different things, things that interest you most. What we are looking for is some evidence of commitment, because that's where you're really going to have more impact. And then we're looking for you to tell us more than just beyond the box. If you've looked at the common application, you probably know that you can list your activity, you can list how many years you've been involved and tell us a bit about your time commitment. And then you have a little space underneath that where you can write a brief statement about that activity. And there's a lot of gold in that because that's where students can say, you know, I'm, I never held an office, but I brought donuts to every meeting or I was the one that stayed after to clean up or whatever. I mean, I'm literally just making things up as we're talking here, but the whole point is that you can help us to understand a little bit more about impact by taking advantage of that space. And frankly, a lot of students do not take advantage of that space. And so that's the kind of, when I talk about putting together a thoughtful application, that's a really good example of a place that you can, you can really do that. Great. All right, I think we can wrap it up, I think with this one last question question here. Does rigor outweigh the grade that you get or, or vice versa? Yeah, that's the classic question. Is it better to make a A in a regular class or a B in an AP class? And I've heard a lot of really bad answers to that question that I will not give you today. But um, what I will say is you need to take classes where you feel you're interested in the course material, you feel you can be successful, and you shouldn't sacrifice other things you want to do in high school. I've been using this example. We had a babysitter this summer. She's a sophomore in high school. First chance to take AP Human Geography. A lot of you know that at her school. But she also takes dance, and her school happens to have a really outstanding dance program with really rigorous courses. And dance and AP Human Geography conflicted. And her mom said to me, because she knows I work in admission, um, she said, should she not take dance and because she needs the AP Human Geography? And I said, she should take dance every day because that's what she is really, that's what she loves. That's what she want, wants to do. We actually happen to know at that school, it's a really rigorous program and she's going to have opportunity to take AP later. So I give you that example to help you to understand that the decision about taking AP should not just be about racking up rigorous courses. You've got to think more broadly about how that fits into overall what you want to do, who you want to be, where your interests lie, and then ultimately, hopefully, if you've chosen wisely, you're going to be successful in the grade that you earn, and so it kind of takes away that question you're asking just a little bit. Perfect. Thank you so much for, for joining us and for asking such wonderful questions, and we will talk to you all soon. Bye.